So we have navigating judgment and shame in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion through the framework of quality improvement and patient safety. Okay, you get to go up. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So this, you can just, um, you know, it's just a little clip. Okay. And, you know, actually the camera is there, but you can circulate around and then your, your slides will appear. I will give you a five minute one. Perfect, okay, great. I'm actually, I'm, and I'm gonna grab my cell phone too, because yeah. then yeah. I can keep track of time too. Yeah. Thank you, Eileen. Perfect. So you guys can see me okay and you hear me okay? My voice doesn't project very well, very well most of the time, so I just want to make sure that's all right. So I want to say thank you for allowing me to be with you here today. Um, let me introduce myself and my story. I'm Q, um, as some of you may know me, which is short for Nguyen Quang Duing, which no one can say. Um, I'm delighted to share that I wake up every day as a pediatrician and I get to go to the office and I get to see little people grow up to be big people who then I will transition to my internal medicine and family medicine colleagues. And core to the, the nature of my work is my delight in watching children and their families grow over time. And central to the theme of this talk is the idea of growth. Oh. Do you have slides? Okay. Yeah, I do have slides. And I just realized I don't have them up. <laughs> How do you find... Where? I sent them to Sarah Ann. Yeah, because that's for Zoom. Yeah. Oh, okay. When we tried to put the regular mic for the room up. Then there, it reverb. Okay, that makes sense. So okay, so I'll, I'll project for the. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I've been hitting the mic for all the people on Zoom. <laughs> Hey, we have copies of your slides that we can ha hand out as a handout. Um, if people would like them, but I think it'll be. And I can also email my slides right now, too. I have my laptop. I got it. I just got to pull them up. Okay. Yes, you did. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> what the heck <laughs> So navigating it probably starts with an N. No, it's under symposium. Oh, it's under symposium. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere. Yep. I have no clue where it is. Do you? It's not showing up in my box folder. She's texting. Mm -hmm. So I'll Yeah, but it has to connect here. Let me see if I can send it to you as well. Did you just try searching for the TED Talks? Yeah, but it's not pulling up in my box, so. That's, yeah. Oh, those are the submissions. Yeah, but there's no more. Mm-hmm. 
together. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so this is our operating system. And like your iPhone, you sometimes have no conscious control over what happens, the direction it takes, or where it saves your photos and your memories. And lots of really smart people have studied this, including people like Daniel Kahneman, who won his Nobel Prize in economics for his work in psychology, and in his book, Fast Thinking versus Slow Thinking, shares about systems one and systems two, where one system is really dynamic and emotional and intuitive, and system two is much slower and more deliberative and much more logical. And both of these systems carry with them their own strengths and weaknesses and their own reliance on different biases. Anthony Greenwald took this a little further and has done what some of you may know is the work behind the implicit association test. And you can't do any work in medicine right now without looking at the IAT, even if it's only for the chance to examine what some of your own biases may be and how you might apply them going forward or mitigate for them going forward. So what does this mean? What if I told you that these two shapes are exactly the same? Some of you may already be familiar with the psychology experiment, but this is a really famous experiment, and our conclusions about what these shapes are are entirely affected by their context as well as our own perspectives. So you can't talk about the work in justice, equity, and diversity, and inclusion without talking about bias. And so just some ground rules. It's unconscious and automatic. It's pervasive. It won't always align with your explicit beliefs. We know this. And it can have real world effects on your behavior, including in the fields of employment, education, justice. But it's malleable. The biases and associations we have formed can be unlearned and replaced with new mental associations. So the only way to mitigate bias is actually to invite diverse perspectives. Some of you may know this man. He was introduced to me when I was a senior in college. And central to the discussion around patient safety, this is Dr. Lucian Leap. Um, center to the discussion of patient safety is that we cannot have shame when we sit at the same table. If we have shame, it will inhibit our own ability to have conversation and open dialogue. But we also have to recognize that we cannot inherently come to the table with the same perspectives as our neighbors because we are a summation of our own upbringing, our experiences, and our exposures. Dr. Lucian Leap and other leaders in the field really spearheaded the efforts behind patient safety and quality improvement. And when I was a senior in college, to hear him talk about preventable errors, system failures, this is an engineering problem. This isn't a value or judgment problem. This is a systems problem. And that means that it can be solvable. And over the last 20 years, they've been able to help us understand that we have to embrace honest dialogue, recognize errors, destigmatize de some of the individual shame to an understanding of system responsibility, and we have to work collaboratively. There is no way that from my work perspective, I can contribute what a medical assistant can bring or a pharmacist or a nurse or any of the other people who are on my care team. And lastly, we have to think about it in a very systematic factor analysis kind of way. You can't talk about patient safety without talking about the Swiss cheese model. And so you get the outcome that your system is designed to produce. If you want different outcomes, you have to change your systems. So what does this have to do with Jedi work? Well, this is our Swiss cheese. This is a graph, a, a table, representing faculty in School of Medicines from 1785 all the, 1765 all the way to 2000. In the 235 years um, that we have this data, we've only increased our percentage points of underrepresented faculty by about 1.5%. 
And this is further a problem when our workforce doesn't have a full spectrum of diversity because we can't meet our patients where they're at. As you can see, 85% of the working psychology workforce is white. Thankfully, we're seeing change, and you see it more in the younger generations with increased representation from Hispanic and black communities. But why is this important? Because we have to believe that what we do is affecting our patient outcomes. This is a paper that came out in August of 2020, a few months after George Floyd was murdered. And in it, the authors had looked at birth infant mortality data between 1992 and 2015 in Florida. So this isn't the 1950s or 60s. And what they found was a 58% reduction in the black infant mortality rate when there was racial concordance. In other words, when black babies were cared for by black physicians, they found a 58% reduction as when compared to when they were cared for by physicians who were not of the same race. This suggests to some degree that some of the mortality rate could have been preventable, maybe even by me. So let's believe the outcomes that demonstrate that health inequity in our systems do exist and step back and ask ourselves, why? So you have to start with what Dr. Villarreal might have said, the pause, right? But begin the conversations. Begin the conversations that help you understand how systems internally and externally work. And this is a document with some interrupters that you might be able to use. But this is how you might begin to cut down that slice, that Swiss cheese model, and interrupt the process that is flowing. Provide the visibility. So our leadership has really done a great job of that, and we have to continue to promote that. And beyond leadership, it also extends to everyone in our communities, because everyone has to be included in the culture change to make sure that the dialogue permeates our professional responsibility and commitment to our patients, our colleagues, and ourselves. The only way for us to change our outcomes is to look at our systems and change those systems. The only way for us to change them is to make sure that you have a, di a diverse set of perspectives at the table to dialogue with and, and look at. So in summary, train your Jedis, promote a culture of transparency, identify challenges and target outcomes, and create platforms for collaboration, interconnectivity, and humility. I'm going to end our conversation with probably one of the proudest moments I've ever had in my career. This was back in 2015 when I was the clinic director of a um, standalone clinic in the Pacific Northwest. And we had gotten some money to do some remodeling, so we were really excited about it. And for months, I had actually been working on a floor plan to present to our staff. In the span of 45 minutes, my staff creamed my floor plan. <laughs> and with the 45 minutes they had working together, they created a master plan that I could have never, ever come up with because they knew their jobs, they knew their experiences, and they knew what they needed. And what we did in that meeting was we empowered them to work in a complementary way to solve a solution. Oh, Barb, you know, when you are doing those allergy shots, I can be watching your patients and still answering the phones. Why don't you put the allergy room across the hall from the, the nurse's station? Things that I couldn't have picked up on perce or perceived because I didn't know their work. And similarly for me here, the issue isn't our intelligence, or our consideration for others, or our love for our patients. This, the issues here is that we cannot alone shoulder the responsibility for equity or justice. We can't do it from our own siloed perspectives. We have to invite others to the table to be able to do that. So engage your team members and help them elevate their voices so that they can tell you how they can solve those problems. And in some cases, their solutions are actually going to be complementary and complementary to your own missions as well. So there's no shame in recognizing that we are a reflection of our experiences and our biases. 
There is only shame if we shirk our responsibilities to mitigate those biases and don't work together to change our health outcomes. Oh, and I had a thank you slide, but I wanted to thank my department chair, Dr. Giordino, as well as colleagues here, including Gretchen Case, Carly Pippitt, and Candace Cho.